Hello and welcome to today's session for Advanced Organizational Development. Today we will talk about OD practitioners, consultants, and uh, some of the latest researchers that you'll see covering various concepts more specifically related to dialogic organizational development and inclusion practices as well as some of the research related to the field of OD. Today we will talk about organizational development uh, from the perspective of different authors, experts, and practitioners in the field. More specifically, we'll focus on dialogic OD practices and inclusion uh, as published and presented in different journal articles and textbooks. Besides reading textbooks, I encourage you to also read journal articles that are based on academic research or practitioner-oriented case studies that can be very beneficial to you in forming your own views and philosophy regarding organization development and effective change management practices. So the field of OD is very wide and there are many, many good articles written from the perspective of academicians, uh, researchers, and then people who are both applied uh, practitioners as well as academic researchers. So they're bridging the world between research and practice in the field. In the field of OD, obviously, we always say uh, you need to be a consultant in order to apply. You need to be an internal consultant or external consultant in order to benefit from uh, the application of the material that we write about, talk about in the field. As most of you know, I spent 16 years of my life in the corporate arena as a manager and then as a management development specialist and internal consultant. So all those years, um, I was learning quite a bit about various OD practices. But in the meantime, I was a practitioner often by applying it to see what works with employees from one week to the next, from one year to the next in some of the strategies that work for us in how we as organization development consultants and human resource professionals can support the strategies of the organization by bringing about uh, good changes to the organization, a high level of uh, competitiveness. For today's lecture, we will focus on one of the articles by Eileen Wasserman, where she wrote about dialogic OD, diversity and inclusion, where you align mindsets, values, and practices that was published in Research and Organizational Change in Development, Volume 23, pages 329 to 356. So it's a very good uh, chapter simply because not only it gives you a lot of literature from over the past four or five decades uh, from the uh, academic leaders and practitioners in the field of OD, but it also gives you a good understanding of what the authors um, who have written about dialogic OD, what they mean by that. So dialogic OD in this case is being contrasted with diagnostic OD. So much of this material that she has written here is a good summary of people like uh, Jervas Bush and Bob uh, Marshak and other uh, authors over the past decade or so that have written about this field of dialogic OD compared to diagnostic OD. So now they're not necessarily uh, mutually exclusive tools or theories or practices in OD, which means you can use all of them simultaneously. So not only by reading this article, you understand a lot more about the concept, but hopefully you go back to the original authors uh, people like Bob Marshak and Jervas uh, Bush to see what they say about Dialogic OD and why uh, they sort of co-founded and supported this field of OD um, for all of us to uh, read, understand, and practice in the field. Secondarily, we will talk about one of the academic studies as a master's thesis at the University of North Texas by Michelle Barnett, where she did some research about organizational development a comparison of individual in organizational level change. So this is a nice uh, research that you can read quickly and understand the science behind academic OD research so you can do something similar in the months and years to come.
In terms of the Dialogic OD Diversity and Inclusion article by Eileen Wasserman, you can see that she is actually uh, associated with Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. So it's a, it's a good uh, article, it's a book chapter that was published, and she's sharing this with all of us so we can benefit from this. Um, so we're thankful, obviously, for people like Eileen Wasserman and uh, Gervas Bush, as well as Bob Marshak for sharing so much material with us online and also through YouTube uh, so we can learn and benefit from their experiences. As we talk about dialogic OD practices, let us look at what the word dialogic actually means. According to a dictionary definition, dialogic refers to the use of conversation or shared dialogue to explore the meaning of some thing, concept, practice, or word. Dialogic conversations do carry on a continual exchange of ideas that can include interaction with previous information that was presented within the team or within uh, the group project. The focus of dialogic OD discussion is not necessarily a new concept because various experts have used it before or at least wrote about its use in the workplace, but the modern experts have done a really good job of explaining it as part of what organization development professionals can do in the workplace to come up with creative solutions in today's complex environment. So if you go back to the last uh, four or five decades, you'll notice that the concept of dialogic uh, discussions have taken place and presented or written uh, by various uh, consultants. For example, in the decade of 1970s, you'll hear people like Peter Drucker, Edgar Schein, Edward Deming, uh, Warren Bennis, and others who talk about management by objective quality circles, total quality management, continuous improvement, goal setting, team building, organizational cultures, and other concepts where th the group was required to work with other people in order to come up with uh, the right solutions. In other words, as an individual consultant manager, we cannot possibly uh, come up with the right solutions for complex problems. So the team has to work together to bring about the solution that is needed for the problem that the company is facing or the opportunity that is available for them. Also in the 1980s, for example, we saw people like Stephen R. Covey who wrote a book about the seven habits of highly effective people where he talked about the fact that we can use empathic listening skills to work with other individuals in our department, in our team, in our project, and we can sort of together synergize by trying to work uh, toward a third alternative in a joint way. So in other words, it's not a win-lose or lose-win situation, but rather we come up with a third alternative that is good for all of us. So that again is the idea behind a solution emerging as a result of our discussion that perhaps um, excludes win-lose or lose-win mindsets. And then in the 1990s, we also saw people like Peter Senge who talked about learning organizations, mental models, and team learning. Uh, Senge clarified the term dialogue and its root uh, Greek word dialogos uh, and the implications of this for creating meaning uh, among people. So in other words, people are conversing with each other in such a way where meaning moves through them. And as a result of that movement of meaning, hopefully they are all learning as a team in coming up with solutions that hopefully puts the company at a competitive position and at a sustainable position in the industry. Over the past two decades, we also see researchers like Gervas Bush, Bob Marshak, uh, William Rothwell, Roland Sullivan, Eileen Wasserman, Mill Silberman, uh, Warner Berg, Deborah Numair, Thomas Cummings, Christopher Worley, and many, many others in the field that have written really good textbooks, journal articles, practitioner-oriented concepts and practices for all of us to benefit. So they've expanded the field of OD 
to new areas, new views, new points of uh, view from the perspective of different individuals. And more specifically, as we talk about Dialogic OD today, so in today's uh, lecture, you'll see a little bit more about Dialogic OD from the perspective of Jervas Bush and Bob Marshak, who have uh, actually together expanded this concept for us to practice immediately into the workplace. And they've done a really good job of differentiating it from diagnostic OD practices, which uh, have been practiced over the past four or five decades. The article by Eileen Wasserman is a book chapter, which focuses on the shift from diagnostic to more dialogic or relational inclusive and emerging OD practices. So she has the question of how is diversity and inclusion integral to dialogic and how do dialogical D practices support the goals of diversity and inclusion? Dialogical D practices focus on the deeply embedded patterns that tend to foster a readiness to sort of disrupt those established patterns in our organizations that have been institutionalized over many years and perhaps decades in some cases, and to enable sort of a shift to more inclusive narratives. Wasserman focuses on how the dialogic and communication perspectives address systemic forces which maintain undesirable prevailing narratives and build the capacity to create more inclusive communities in our departments and organizations. Dialogic approaches uh, to OD view organizations as meaning-making or sense-making systems where social reality emerges from dialogic processes in associated social and political interactions among various uh, stakeholders, actors, and team members that are involved in it. In this hierarchy of meaning model, you can see the story of why we as individuals do our job. The story of each episode, each event, each situation, and the story of relationships with our customers, our patients, our vendors, our suppliers, and the story of relationships across functions. Now, depending on who tells the story, it might be a little bit different. It might be a little bit different because we are different individuals. We come from diverse communities, diverse backgrounds, and we have our own unique perspectives. And obviously, as you can see here, these concentric circles sort of interact with each other and sometimes the meaning can change depending on how it is viewed from the perspective or points of views of different individuals in different hierarchies. Wasserman says that meaning is continuously being reconstructed in each successive moment, shifting and expanding based on the complexities of our identities, the stories, and the many contexts that we're living in. So that's a very good way of actually seeing how meaning can vary from person to person, from story to story, and from situation to situation, depending on how it's told, how it's heard, how it's interpreted. In the DAISY model, you can see the various influences on a single speech in how a single speech or act can be influenced by different perspectives from stories about differences, stories about the self, stories about the rules of engagement, stories about our group, stories about one's group relationships with another, and stories about the culture, and stories about our differences as individuals, as people of different religions, people of different uh, genders, and people of different ethnicities and cultures, and so on. In this L-U-U-U-U-T-T model, uh, we can see that there are differences in terms of the stories that are lived, stories that are told, stories that are untold, unknown stories, un told stories, unheard stories. So again, all of these stories that I may not hear, but others might hear it. And if others hear it, do they hear it the way it was intended? Do they hear it differently if it was told by somebody who actually lived it versus somebody who only heard it from somebody who lived it? So the meaning can vary quite a bit depending on all of these different elements of how a story could be communicated to other individuals 
In other words, the meaning could vary quite a bit. The perspective could vary quite a bit depending on how we hear the story and which stories we actually hear and how we make meaning out of the story the way it was told to us. Communication in this view is seen as more constructive than representational. The perspective on change that was introduced by Dialogical D is that change is actually interpretive and discursive. In other words, it's ongoing and continuous in contrast to the perspective that change is somewhat episodic and discreet. Wasserman provides a nice scenario or vignette uh, where she says a physician of the Middle Eastern descent walked into a staff room for a break between surgeries. So people she has called colleagues and friends for over 20 years uh, all of a sudden look at her if, as if she's a stranger. She wonders what just happened. Then she notices what they were actually watching on television and in that split second believes that she has become a terrorist in their eyes. This scenario described is a simple example of how we make meaning of our relationships, which can shift from one moment to the other moment. The process of creating coherence and coordinating meaning with other people has become more complex over the past four or five decades as more and more dimensions of differences Things like race, gender, culture, nationality, ethnicity, sexual orientation, different abilities, and so on actually become part of our workforce. So these dimensions of differences are a part of our daily life in our work, in our communities, as the workforce has become more diverse and is going to continue to be more diverse than ever uh, before. Also, significant shifts have occurred in diversity practice in leadership within companies. These shifts kind of alter and in many cases do expand the framing of how we define what is meant by the term diversity, the related practices of inclusion, as well as the implications for what it actually means to leverage differences in the process of relating in the public space, which again has been discussed by OD professionals over the past three, four decades. We know that change is a constant, emergent, and unfolding in real time every single day, and it's becoming, obviously, uh, toward you faster and faster. We know that discourse and discursive processes from a social constructionist perspective are what constructs our social reality in organizational life, rather than merely representing, reporting, or reflecting what actually is. Ultimately, changing the existing dominant discourse is what creates narratives and diverse perspectives that can sort of unleash new ways of thinking, new ways of acting and engaging, thereby supporting change in our organizations. Bush in Marshak actually concluded that organizations change by changing the everyday conversations in organizational discourse. So interventions focus on creating spaces where organizational members come together to share their understanding of the multiple social realities and to create alignment for decisions and actions that they all take. So that's where the coordination actually happens. According to Bush and Marsha, Dialogical D focuses on changing the collective meaning making which guides behavioral changes in teams, projects, organizations, and in our communities. In this model of equal employment opportunity affirmative action leveraging diversity and inclusion, you can see that Wasserman uh, talks about previous research in how EEO is differentiated from affirmative action, thereby from diversity, and finally from inclusion. 
So historically, if we go back all the way to the 1960s, we see that the U.S. Congress and President at that time created certain equal employment opportunity laws to create a more level playing field. Then in the decade of 1970s, we had affirmative action concepts and practices. And finally, we focused oftentimes on diversity thinking we can synergize. However, the problems of discrimination and inequality did not necessarily go away. So today's environment, we are obviously still applying EEO affirmative action and diversity practices, but we need to go beyond that to include everyone in the decision makings that impact the organization, their jobs, and their day-to-day -day living. So this model is a very good way of looking at four to five decades of focus on getting to the point of including everybody in the conversations. As Wasserman mentions, inclusive dialogic OD approaches create the conditions of trust and safety for people to be able to share their different experiences without necessarily needing to resolve perspectives that may seem to be in conflict with each other. In inclusive dialogic conversations, uh, people need to be trained to avoid certain common responses that can lead to experiences of double daily indignity for a colleague or a person who's actually being treated with discriminatory statements or uh, practices or a colleague who is being harassed uh, because of discrimination. In terms of common responses, we know that when somebody comes and says that I think I'm being discriminated against because I am a male, or I'm a female, or I'm black, or I am Jewish, or I'm Muslim, or I am having a disability. Oftentimes, we might respond in a common manner by saying, maybe they did not mean to discriminate against you. Maybe they just were making a statement. I don't think uh, that's always the case where you interpret something as discriminatory when, in fact, it may not be the case. So when we are actually responding in a common way to the other person, perhaps we're trying to be helpful, but the challenge is that that person might be going through that type of discrimination every single day. So he or she knows what the person said or how the person treated him or her. So in his or her mind, that is discrimination, but you and I respond with common phrases Oh, come on, they didn't mean it that way. That, that, that doesn't make sense because that's not that person's personality or they shouldn't be doing that, so therefore they probably did not mean it that way. When we respond with these common responses, we are causing the person to feel like a victim a second time in the same day. That's why it's called double daily indignity. First of all, the person was discriminated against today because of a dimension of diversity that differentiates her or him from all the other people in the group. Secondly, you're basically telling the person that he or she is misinterpreting the situation because they didn't mean it that way. So in a way, you're telling the person that he or she is lying uh, about the fact that he or she was discriminated against. So that's why, again, it's called double daily indignity. Thereby, we need to avoid these common responses. A truly inclusive dialogic process would not seek to question the accuracy of a statement, but rather would create the conditions for each participant to be present to the story in the moment as the other felt it. That's what Wasserman actually mentions in her article. Meaning is continuously being constructed in each successive moment, shifting and expanding based on the complexities of our identities, the stories, and the many contexts that we're living in every single day. The practice of inclusive dialogical OD supports a learning stance. Being a learning involves some degree of surrender to not knowing and actually acknowledging that mistakes will be made in our work groups, in our projects. In the context of being humble and not knowing, each of us can attune to the other person in a way that creates a mutuality of being considerate, honoring, valuing, and respecting connections, distinctions in that which we do not understand. Dialogical deep process do move our world toward a more inclusive process. 
in that they embrace multiple perspectives and also invite all members of a system to the conversation by being engaged, by being heard, by being considered from various points of views that they bring to the conversation. Yet, given the remnants of historical power inequalities, intentionality around inclusion is one important consideration that is emphasized by Wasserman in her article. Overall, each organization needs to be able to identify their strategic priorities and actively search for potential alliances within their walls and beyond them in their communities. Having diverse lenses with which to look into the future as it emerges is consequential to achieving unexpected and truly maximizing hidden potential. So that's something that we all really want and we should look forward to. That's why it's so important to be inclusive in everything we do. In summary, let us emphasize that we create our relationships in the culture of the enterprise in our conversations. Communication is consequential in the patterns of communication we engage in, create, and sustain things. So these are good statements that Eileen Wasserman has made in the article. If we're able to transform our patterns of communication, then we gain powerful leverage for transforming the world. Think about the importance of effective communication in transforming the patterns of our communication to bring transformation to the entire world. For additional reflections, I recommend you see Jarvis Bush's interview on Dialogic OD. This is a very good uh, investment of time to understand the material directly from him, how they came up with the concept of Dialogic OD uh, between uh, Bush and Marshak, and he explains it very clearly and very eloquently as an academician uh, as well as a practitioner. He talks about how it was kind of difficult to get publications in the academic world, but once uh, they were able to use the proper language in terms of dialogic being differentiated from diagnostic OD practices, then all of a sudden uh, people understood what they were uh, trying to say and what they were meaning uh, by their articles. So they are uh, some of the top leaders now in the field of um, organizational development and I think their perspective is very important for all of you to learn and also for all of us to actually practice and apply. Also, I recommend that you watch the videos entitled Dialogic OD Approach to Transformation. This is where both uh, Bob Marshak and Jervas Bush actually have a conversation, discussion uh, about how they came up about to write about Dialogic OD how they came to be co-authors and how they got to know each other in the field uh, as academicians and practitioners. And both parts of this video are, uh, again, very good and they shed light on the history of OD, the practice of OD, and how dialogic OD is differentiated uh, from diagnostic OD techniques, tools, and practices. So do watch this because, again, it's very important to hear directly from the top leaders in the field. Now let us look at the master's thesis by Michelle Barnett on organizational development, a comparison of individual and organizational level change. Hopefully you can do some research in the future that is similar to this and maybe one that goes beyond and above the research she and others have done so far. The master's thesis research to determine if organizational change occurs in a top-down or bottom-up manner. She used the meta-analysis which was conducted using 238 field experiments. 
Each study was coded for intervention in organizational outcome and for individual or organizational level variables. Uh, the effect sizes were calculated for each study, each level in each level by intervention and outcome measure. The result was that while organizational change development interventions overall had a moderate effect size, the level of intervention or outcome was not a moderating variable. Barnett mentions that there are three levels at which change is measured, the individual, the team, and the organization. She goes on to mention that individual change is the most common level of analysis, most likely because many change initiatives are targeted at changing the individual's behavior. Her research question is as follows. Is significantly changing the individual behavior necessary for achieving lasting organizational change? In terms of literature, uh, we know that researchers such as Macy and Izumi argue that individual change is not really a necessary precursor of organizational change, but instead that it takes place from the top down. Now, we also know as a result, as Barnett continues to say that individual change may not be a necessary component of organizational change. So she hypothesized that individual level change initiative will result in smaller effective outcomes than group or organization level initiatives. Ultimately, Barnett concludes that both the individual in group or organization level interventions were effective in changing in organization according to her study. So organizational change in development inter interventions can be effective both at the individual as well as at the organizational levels. So Barnett's empirical study with 238 field experiments do demonstrate that organizational change in development practices can be effective in changing organizations. Sometimes it's very helpful to actually go through the dissertation uh, by looking at the table of content. So Michelle Barnett's uh, thesis entitled Organizational Development, a Comparison of Individual and Organizational Level Change uh, can be found online. And, and you can see that it was published at the University of North Texas. So let's look at um, the table of content. So in this case, you can see she talks about the problem statement, introduction, methodology, results, discussion, and then appendix and references. So it's really a good source to look at, especially if you're going to do a research paper for this course or other classes that relates to this topic. But my recommendation is look at maybe about five to 10 different master's thesis and even doctoral thesis because they give you references and also literature all in one place. And also you learn by looking at the methodology that they use and the findings that they have. So you learn based on empirical study that was conducted by a researcher at the university and documented in their library or uh, made available publicly through social media or through library. So you can actually skim through the problem statement. You can see she talks about organizational change and development uh, being studied by researchers interested in identifying the effectiveness of change initiatives for a number of years. So she's quickly describing what the problem statement is, what the reader can expect actually in this thesis. Then she starts talking about chapter one, introduction. In this case, you can see she begins uh, by citing uh, very credible people like Beckhardt, for example, all the way from 1969, who defined organizational change as the improvement of organizational effectiveness in health through providing intervention, development activities, and programs for organization improvement. Page 20, since it's a direct quotation. So you're writing papers that are very similar to this for the class. In this case, uh, you may not be doing empirical study during one term, 
but if you were to do a master's thesis you would obviously follow the same format or same methodology to arrive at scientific conclusions so on page three of the master's thesis she gives you this nice table about OCD intervention classification taxonomies used by the six reviewed studies so she talks about Newman and colleagues she talks about Macy and Izumi and she continues to talk about other researchers in the coming pages so this is all good literature and then she also discusses some of these people obviously throughout the chapter and relates it to her research why she's studying certain variables so she continues to discuss OD concepts and justifying her research in chapters one and two and then she comes to chapter three here about methodology she talks about the sample how the sample was collected the questions that were asked and then how the results were analyzed so it's another important chapter then she comes to the results or descriptive analysis of her study which should be very interesting for you as you skim through it again you don't have to understand exactly all of the statistical methodologies that are used in these studies because uh, you may not use them right now so this part should not be very difficult you can read and skim through it very quickly to understand what results they got so we know that certain medications are helpful for certain illnesses right so a doctor does not have to personally operate on people to see how a medicine is helping the person inside his or her body so the doctors rely on other doctors who have studied this and they know that certain medications are beneficial because it has been studied already in proving based on science that it works so you and I do the same thing we don't have to understand all of the methodologies that have been used by previous researchers but we need to understand what they did and what they arrived at in which theories were proven which hypotheses were supported and which ones were not finally she comes to the discussion part where she tells us basically what the results actually mean what are the implications of it you can see she's also discussing the limitations of her study because if we had enormous amount of resources or unlimited time to do a study we could uh, obviously have a bigger project and spend more time discussing the literature researching the topic and talking to more people and maybe applying uh, the material into different cultures to see how different cultures respond to the same questions on the survey or through qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, interviews but unfortunately we don't have unlimited resources thereby we always will have some limitations in all the studies so you should need to keep in mind the limitations that each researcher goes through and if you're a master's student obviously oftentimes there's no money for research so you have to do the best you can with available resources and the thesis has the references which means it's a really good resource for you to go and look at the articles and textbooks that you might be the most interested in or the ones that are more relevant for your research paper in this course so you can go look through them and then uh, read the material from the original authors these are some of the textbooks that I have used in the class and many of you who are living in Fort Lauderdale Florida you can go to campus in at least check out or skim through uh, the textbooks that I have written related to managing workplace stress managing and coaching performance and cross-cultural change management practices but let me also mention the textbooks that are assigned for your reading every single week or during the semester uh, are very helpful for you to get to know the OD concepts and practices the theory behind them and also some of the knowledge that these practitioner oriented academicians do bring into the field so the textbooks that you see on the screen again uh, sometimes they require reading sometimes they're recommended readings for you they're very helpful however we recommend that you go above and beyond the textbooks uh, as academicians in order to be aware of the latest research in the field of organization development uh, so you can also share your best practices in academic research as well as practitioner oriented techniques 
in the field of OD with others um, who can benefit from it in every single industry. These are some of the journal article readings that uh, all of you uh, should know right now. Obviously, in the coming decade, we'll have more articles that will be uh, relevant for your reading and to stay updated. Uh, but these articles that you see should be available to you right now. Some of them are ranging all the way from 2000s all the way to uh, 2015 and so on. So try to look at the latest material that is written by people who have some level of expertise in the field. And these journal articles have always been reviewed by usually two to five um, experts in the field. So if they recommend it for publication, that means there's some kernel of truth or some really good gems in there for you to read. And once you read about 50 to 100 articles in the field, you sort of become aware of who is who in the field. And most of the journal articles will have very similar literature when it comes to the history of OD. And then you basically look at what is new in that article from that author's perspective in terms of applied um, practices or academic research that they've done they want to share with everybody else. So once you read the 50 to 100 classic articles in the field, then the rest of the articles become a little bit easier to read and more enjoyable because you kind of understand what is new there and what the benefit would be to you as an academician or as a practitioner. So these are very helpful articles, again, going back to on this slide all the way till 1969. So it covers the past five decades um, academically at least so but but there's a lot of textbooks that you should be reading as well good luck with your readings in summary of at least one journal article related to the topic of organization development and change management for your term paper in this course as always remember that organization development and change management is part of life so we need to police, evaluate, and improve our consultancy, our change management, our organizational development uh, skills every single day. So plan and manage everything you do effectively. Good luck.